God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Please be seated. I have a niece that doesn't sound remarkable. As a matter of fact, an analysis of a long-term study of extended kin kinship showed a per capita, a per capita range of 1.72 to 4.25 nieces or nephews for participants, at least those who reached about 45 years old and older. Many of you probably have 1.72 to 4.25 nieces, nephews, or a combination. But until rather recently, I wasn't free to say, I have a niece. She wasn't raised in our family. She was born at a time when our mother had just helped my sister leave an abusive spouse. Our own family was significantly dysfunctional at the time. So my sister made a selfless decision to let this precious child be adopted by a couple who desperately wanted a child of their own and could provide a stable and loving home that provided some consolation. However, no matter how good a decision it was for everyone involved at the time, it left a wound. We couldn't really speak of it. We had to protect people's privacy. It was a different time then. We moved on, but never entirely. Every year on the anniversary of my niece's birth, you know where our thoughts were. As cousins got married and had children, aunts and uncles had grandchildren, these events brought both joy and private pain. My own daughter came along eventually, we celebrated, but a piece of our family was always missing. We were never whole. Our mother prayed that eventually her other granddaughter would come looking for us. Mom went to her grave disappointed. Our father never met his first granddaughter, and I'm not sure my brother ever knew of her. And then one day, my niece reached out to my sister. We've started the process of connecting with her, but it is a process, one of relationship building. No fast forward button to speed through to happy ending. It won't ever be as if we kept her with us. She already has a good and caring family, the one that worked to raise her. So we'll have to do our work at her pace and maybe one day we'll all be whole. Our family experience is hardly unique. The individual circumstances are, of course, but many families have a similar enough story to tell. So many, in fact, that there's a documentary series on the subject titled Long Lost Family. If you haven't heard of it, the series is described this way. The show helps provide aid to individuals to be looking to be reunited with long-lost biological family members. Sounds like a straightforward detective work, followed by getting permission to exchange contact information and arranging some happy meetings. The two facilitators who have their own personal experience of reconnecting with, with lost relatives help guests and viewers alike understand it's frequently a much more complex and deeply emotional process. Sometimes one parent is never told they had a child. Some, um, some siblings may have been placed for adoptions, while others remain with the birth family. One sibling might have been adopted into a healthy, happy family while another ended up in foster care and troubled situations. There are as many situations, it seems, as there are people. Meeting lost relatives when they agree to meet is just the beginning. Their real reunion takes effort and commitment. To understand the whys and wherefores of their separation. To acknowledge their different, sometimes painful, 
painful experiences of life, to find whatever degree of resolution is possible, and to navigate their way into meaningful, loving relationships. Their willingness to persevere speaks to our need to know where we're from, who our people are, our need for belonging and for union. People are longing to be knit together again in order to be made whole. That longing is known to God and it's mutual. With the incarnation, God took a radical new action with the process, in the process of um, reconciliation. But by definition, it was of limited duration. As we hear in the Gospel of John today, Jesus is closing his earthly ministry among his disciples. He has spoken a lot over the past weeks about his union with God. He has tried to demonstrate it and point the way his ministry. He has urged his disciples to be one with each other. It sounds as if he's just saying they need to get along, but it's so much deeper and needs more time than he's got left. He tells them, go back to Jerusalem and wait. He'll send the Holy Spirit, who will, in a way, continue to explain this union to them. They do so. The timing is very interesting. We are told that there were also Jews from every nation and empire of the known world living there at the time. From regions that we know as Iran, Iraq, Syria, modern day Israel and Palestine, Asia Minor, Egypt, parts of Libya, and around much of the Mediterranean, a vast area. They were gathered for the Jewish Pentecost feast. Early Jewish Pentecost celebrations commemorated the first grain harvest in the Promised Land. The feast became associated with the giving of the law, Torah, when God gave Moses the commandments at Mount Sinai. So the Jewish Pentecost also commemorates Israel becoming a constitutional body it celebrates common identity. They were united by faith, but certainly not language, customs, or much of anything else. Related, yes, but effectively, siblings separated as children and raised in different families. It's into this context that the Holy Spirit arrives like a rushing, violent wind and tongues of fire. Of all the mighty acts of power the Spirit could have displayed in that moment, what would we expect? Maybe the sort of divine spectacle suggested in the psalm. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they smoke. Perhaps an earthquake that shakes the temple to its foundations or a volcano spewing ash. Maybe something nicer Miracles of mass healing, or the Roman Empire suddenly withdrawing. But we get none of that. Instead, the first act of the Holy Spirit is to give the faithful the power to communicate, to speak in all the languages of those gathered, and to comprehend what is being said. Christian Pentecost speaks to our deep longing for union and belonging, and that's not accidental. In this moment where the church first meets the world, we get a glimpse of what human wholeness might look like, a vision of success in the church's ministry of reconciliation. It's a beautiful vision. It's also brief. The moments when everyone seems to belong and be unified are the exception rather than the rule. As I said, real reunion takes commitment and work. Like the vision of resurrection of the long dead house of Israel in Ezekiel, 
New life comes in stages, and ultimately it requires the breath of God. So we read this Pentecost passage every year. What might we take away from the story this time around? I'll name three things. First, that even in the church, we aren't all the same. We bring different needs, hopes, styles, expectations, different languages, if you will. If the Holy Spirit thinks it's important enough to communicate in various languages, who are we to disagree? Second, the ministry of reconciliation doesn't mean eliminating our differences. As the psalm today celebrates, O oh Lord, how manifold are your works. In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. The church needs to embrace real diversity, or at least become curious. Third, the church doesn't carry out ministry through its own power but by the power of the Holy Spirit. In the psalm, again, you send forth your spirit, and they are created, and so you renew the face of the earth. God does invite human agents. A.W. Tozer wrote in the 20th century, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on, and no one would know the difference. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop, and everybody would know the difference. A sad comment. These things seem especially important as we emerge more fully from our pandemic isolation and we engage more fully with one another and the world. You've heard it said um, before that the pandemic has brought disaster, but it has also brought opportunity. Let us build on that opportunity. Let's meet one another and the world as the disciples did in, on that first Christian Pentecost. We can meet one another's differences, learn anew what God created in each and how the Spirit might be using our varied gifts. We can meet the world less as a stranger, more as long-lost relatives with whom we seek to build a relationship. We can renew our commitment to be led by the Spirit, to make evident by every action, every word, every thought, that it is indeed the Spirit at work and that should we stop doing anything we do, the whole world will know. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and we shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. O oh God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of the faithful, grant that by that same Spirit we may be truly wise and ever enjoy your kindness.